Years ago, began to connecting the United States with Sodom and Gomorrah, saying that God will soon destroy the United States like Sodom and Gomorrah because of the practice of homosexuality. You ever heard that? Well, that first question is, is homosexuality the reason God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah? That's a good question. So, here's my premise. God did not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah only because of sexual perversions. There are sexual perversions that included more than homosexuality were simply one of the natural results of any person or any culture rejecting God. The real thing is not homosexuality, that's just a manifestation, one of many, okay? Romans chapter one is gonna give you so many manifestations your head will spin off. It's just, and it's in, it's in, it's in a progressive system of degeneration you know, exchanging uh, the image of God for the creature, the truth for the lie, then, it, then it all kind of sexual perversions. Right now in America, they're trying to normalize pedophilia. You know, they're, 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 the farther this goes, the more things are gonna find that's okay, bestiality, necrophilia, whatever blows your dress up. Or, or as I see it now, whatever feels good. So, first of all, as we will see in Romans 1, 16 through 32, homosexuality is one of the inevitable results of the degeneracy process that occurs whenever a person, group, or culture rejects God's revelation of his essence and then the gospel. You know, the age of accountability when a person begins to question, does God exist? Is there a God? If they say, yes, I believe there's a God, then we believe, I believe God will send the gospel. Say, okay, who is this God and how do I connect with him? Well, he sends the gospel. You have to believe in Christ. And when you do, you're in. But at the point of recognizing or, or deciding if there is a, is a God and you say no, there's no God, there's only evolution, then you may not even hear the, hear the gospel. You know, you might, but you may not, because God is not responsible. When you say no to Him and reject His revelation that's in your own conscience and in nature, then you begin to, you begin to move away from God and, and into evil, into all kinds of things. So... I think we understand that idea that you'd say, yes, there's a God, the gospel comes, then you get to say yes or no to that. Two yeses is a good thing. One no <laughs> is a bad thing. All right, secondly, while known for the attempted homosexual rape of two angels in Genesis 19, do y'all know that story? Now, I know I'm a strange person. You just don't even know how strange, but I mean, I'm just trying to imagine all of these men in Sodom being able to get at two angels. I mean, could you imagine what kind of a can of you know what would get opened on those guys? Imagine trying to rape an angel. That's just... Sorry, just my weird humor. Uh, I just thought that would be really be funny. I mean, who would get the worst end of that? Anyway, while they're known, while Sodom is known for homosexuality, those cities were long, long, long caught into degeneracy that had led them further and deeper into various kinds of selfishness, sinfulness, and evil, just like us. See, in 1962, how many years ago was that? 60? 
That's when the Supreme Court ruled that Christianity had to come out of the, the public schools. No more Bible, no more prayer. Can't do it. That's a long time. So we've been moving into this for a long time. What's about to happen, what you're seeing happen in, our, in America is not something new. It's just now being uncovered and being made so obvious you can't not see it. So, and it has many different facets. So, oh, by the way, we went to the, Ron and I went to the Moody High School football game where we had a, a, a stellar sideline announcer, <laughs> radio personality. Uh, and you know what they did before they started anything? What did they do? They prayed. Hallelujah. I was happy with that. Yeah. I was happy with that. So thirdly, in the ancient world, here's another piece of this puzzle. See, what I'm talking about right now, Sodom and Gomorrah, the fact that they're known for the homosexuality that was going on, especially with these two angels and the whole uh, thing with Lot. Uh, Lot's trying to protect them. Lot, see, Lot's sitting at the gate. I mean, he, apparently he had become one of the leaders of the city, or at least he thought so because they, they mocked him, said this guy, this foreigner, thinks he's going to be a judge over us. But when he saw them, he apparently recognized them as angels. And, he, and he, they said, we're going to stay in the town square. You know, we're going to sleep in the park. He said, oh, no, no. Come into my house. He recognized who they were. He knew they were from God. That's just me reading into that. But he got them in his house. See, you have to ask yourself, do you know the story where he offers his daughters? You know, where you go, what's going on there? Well, just, again, speculation. I think that he knew who they were, that they were angels from Jehovah. And he would rather see his daughters harmed in that way than, than to give up these angels. I don't know. I don't know. I wouldn't give my daughters up. Angels can take care of themselves, I'm thinking. But anyway, in the ancient world, because of the harsh conditions of the land, the practice of hospitality to strangers was considered very important. And those who refused to honor it were considered selfish evildoers. This is Genesis 19.8 when Lot says, Take my daughters, not these men. Why? They have come under the protection of my roof, my hospitality. I have taken them in. They are under my protection. That's how strong hospitality was. You were required. If you were any kind of decent person, you were required to take a stranger off the, out of the desert into your home and give them food and water and rest and give them a place. That was required. It was, not, it was more than a custom. It was a very, very, it's required, it's important. Job 31, 32, Job talks about his commitment to hospitality as part of his righteousness. In Matthew 25, Jesus talking about this same thing, you know, the when did, when did we help you, Lord? When did we feed you? When did we give you water? When you did to the least of these. You know, that's the same idea. Hospitality. You, you help out the stranger. You, you bring in the, the person who's without, you know, they've come through a harsh place and now they need help. And so you help them. Le Leviticus 19.34 says, View strangers in your home as one of you. Love him as yourself. Now this stranger, someone who's just come in from the road, and you're to bring him in your home and treat him like he's one of your family and love him like you love yourself. That's how strong this hospitality idea was. Judges 19, 20 through 21, Romans 12, 13, there's so many passages that talk about it all the way through the New Testament. So hospitality, really what it was, is a manifestation of your goodness, your righteousness. But for the believer, it was a manifestation of your relationship with the Lord. It's the same with the care of the helpless widow and the orphan. 
This also was a commitment required by the law and by those, of, by those growing in grace. In Deuteronomy 27, 19, Cursed is he who distorts the justice that is due or owed to an alien. That's a stranger, an orphan, and widow. And all the people shall say amen. So James tells us that we should take care of widows and orphans. Does the congregation say amen? Amen. Yes. All right. And Exodus twenty two twenty two. You shall not afflict any widow or orphan. You know, Jesus spoke about the Pharisees who would find legal ways to take away widows' homes. That's how evil and degenerate those people were. Psalm 68, 5. And here's the, here's the real principle of, of God as a father of the fatherless and a judge for the widow is God in his holy habitation. So what I'm trying to say to you, if you'll just follow me for a minute, and in, in summary here is that Sodom and Gomorrah, of course this homosexuality was going on, perversion, sexual perversions of all kinds, you know, day and night, um, and yet this was just part. They were very selfish, they were very degenerate, they had turned away from God, they had rejected God, they did not retain God in their hearts and their knowledge. They did not follow God's boundaries or God's principles of life. They rejected all that. And therefore, they begin to degenerate. So you don't just reject God and then you're like, here. That's not how it works. If you reject God, listen, as a believer, if you quit listening to God, if you quit taking in the Word, you quit talking to the Lord, you get stuck in anger or bitterness, you begin to move away. You begin to degenerate. All of a sudden, it's easier to sin. Sin is, sin is more pronounced in your life. For the unbeliever moves away from God, they've got nothing to bring them back. It's terrible. And listen, I'm not talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm talking about America. I hope you realize that. I'm talking about America where we are or where we're going. You know, um, when all this craziness started back a couple years ago, Ronald taught uh, Elijah, nation in turmoil, a nation with evil government, clamping down, trying to destroy all the priests of Jehovah. What do you do? What is the answer? You know what it wasn't? It wasn't political. There was no political solution. And so people get caught up in the whole political thing and think, well, our answer is Trump. <laughs> That's kind of funny. I mean, I'm all for the guy, for his policies anyway. You know, conservative policies. Absolutely. That's how a nation should run. But listen, this, is, this has gone so far into the ditch that only God can pull us out. And, and we, listen, we might be better off if he just tears it all apart and starts over. I don't know. But the sexual perversions of Sodom and Gomorrah were only a symptom of a deeper long-term process of spiritual corruption. It started and is caused by rejecting God himself, then rejecting the Messianic gospel. This is Old Covenant. And his boundaries of right behavior. And you know what happens when you reject any kind of boundaries of right behavior? What is it? Anything goes. There are no boundaries. No right, no wrong, no up, no down. In fact, what happens, the farther you go in this degeneration, everything flips. So what used to be good is now evil. Christianity was the, is the, listen, it's all about love. But you know what it's called now? Hate. It flips. They redefine everything. There's a guy named Matt, Matthew Walsh, uh, 
he did a documentary called What is a Woman? Did y'all see that? You should see that. What is a woman? He ran around and interviewed all these professional people, these doctors and professors and all that, and he would say, what is a woman? And they would go, well, we can't answer that. He'd go, why? What is a woman? And they would, uh, they would all finally just turn and leave him. So finally he does all this. This is a 30-minute documentary. He goes home and he speaks to his wife and he said, honey, what is a woman? She says, an adult female. Hello. But craziness, craziness. That's what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah, not just homosexuality. All right, so where there, are, where there are no divine standards, then the people believe that anything goes if it feels good. In Judges chapter 17, verse 6, in those days there was no king in Israel, in other words, no righteous authority, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. So you get to decide for you what's right. I decide for me what's right. And then it boils down to who has more power, more cunning in a dog-eat-dog -dog world to be able to get their way. If your way is contrary to mine, then either I got to go somewhere else to get my way or I got to do something to keep you from getting your way. That's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. And that's, what, that's what's being produced. All right, John 18, 38. When Pilate responded to Jesus, who was talking about the truth, said, what is truth? In other words, is there such a thing as truth? You know, it's just relative. Isn't truth relative? Isn't it your truth and my truth? You know, if I woke up today and I felt more soft and girly, do I get to go to the girls' bathroom now? That's what they're doing in, your, in our public schools. They're doing that. They've been doing that. And if you complain about it as a teacher or a parent, you will be fired and you will be shut down. We're in a crazy place, folks. So I'll, I'll, get, I'll, get, I'll try to get off the drama here. But the people of Sodom and Gomorrah had long since rejected God and His Word you know, becoming tribal. That's what we call that identity politics. You know, identity politics says you're only worth what you are in your group. Willie, you don't belong in this group. You belong with other black people. You, that's your only worth is with those people. You believe that? <laughs> no, me neither. So, but people become tribal, they become lawless and corrupt. With an abundance, listen, they have an abundance. This is Sodom and Gomorrah, but they neglect the needy widow and orphan. And they violently mistreat visiting strangers. Ezekiel 16, 49 tells the story. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had arrogance. They had abundant food and careless ease but did not help the poor and needy. That was Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay? So, this is a whole range of de degeneracy and depravity. You know, they were all self-centered and selfish. They had plenty, and they let the poor, the widow and the orphan, just die on the vine. They didn't help the stranger that came along. They were just completely inward and self-centered. And they, anything goes, and so they began to do whatever they wanted to do completely uh, irrespective of God. I wanted to read you another one, Isaiah. If you want to return to Isaiah chapter 1. Pretty interesting, this is the first chapter of Isaiah. He's talking to Israel, but he pretends like he's talking to Sodom and Gomorrah. So he's... he's He's calling Israel Sodom and Gomorrah. If you'll go to chapter 1, verse 10, we'll read through 17. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. This is Israel. Give ear to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What are your multiplied sacrifices to me? 
says the Lord. I've had enough of burnt offerings, of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. This was, of course, their sacrifices. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity in the, sol in the solemn assembly. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yet, yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. Wash yourself, make yourself clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil. Then he says, learn to do good. Seek justice, reprove the ruthless, defend the orphan, and plead for the widow. You see how all that's tied together? How their religious doings didn't impress the Lord? Okay. So people ask me, how did the United States become so corrupt so fast? I answer, it wasn't fast. We've been on this track for many years, and the total takeover of evil has just recently become obvious. As people in the United States become addicted to technology and entertainment, they, they have become, they became uh, unwilling to sit at length to consider and discuss deep and necessary theological ideas. Churches begin to entertain. As we have allowed ourselves to become lost, see, we're in this degenerous, degenerating cycle. As we have allowed ourselves to become lost in the screens of our phones, addicted to 30 second blips to entertain us. Listen, we started out unwilling, but now we've become unable to concentrate, to read, or listen at length. Listen, when's the last time you read a book? All the way through. If you've, if you've kept that skill, I salute you. Many people that I know can't read a book anymore. They can only watch the screen. 20, you know, 20 minute videos. I watch them too, but, you know, we've gotta be able to sit down and discuss important, necessary ideas. We do in this church. That's the difference, part of the difference. So, the Christian church in America has all but collapsed as spiritual educators. We've turned to professional level music and, but not near as good as Ed Jones, and, uh, and feel good messages to hold people to pilfer their tithe, turning the pastor into high profit careers. You know, one of the things that early on I fell in love with, I, I read the back of one of Bob Thames' books, and it talked about the financial policy. And it said, we don't charge for anything. We don't request money, we don't charge money. We'll send everything we can, as long as we can. Until the money runs out, we'll keep sending. It's yours free. You know why? Because Jesus Christ paid for it. And now, now we're sending it to you. I said, I don't, I don't know if it gets better than that. And I fell in love with that. And so now I've, that's how we work in this church. You think this guy works for money? You'd be, a, you'd be, I, I won't talk about your life, but you know, it ain't about money. It's about the Lord. It's about serving Him. And Nobody here does anything for money. <laughs> you know? No, we don't do it for money. We do it. Listen, one of the reasons that Ronald gets up every week and does this is he loves you. He loves you. You know, and he loves the Lord. And this is what he's been told to do. So he does it. So Gentile nations, when you're dealing with Gentile nations, it's, we're not like Israel. God disciplines the believers in the Gentile nation. Us, the church. 
Everything that happens politically, economically, militarily, all that is related to how God is dealing with the church. It's all for us. What is God doing in the life of the unbeliever beyond trying to prepare them to hear the gospel? Not much, because it's about us. He's dealing with us. No pressure, but we are the answer. We are the solution. Your prayers could very well be the tipping point for God turning things around for us. Your one extra prayer for the right thing could be it. No pressure. All right. Gentile nations, God disciplines believers to turn us, back, turn us around back to Him, to expose our false worldly beliefs and, and behaviors, to, to show us our focus on financial instead of spiritual prosperity. You know, many people want America to prosper so that they can hold on to their prosperity. Do we realize that a congregation of people this age, I mean, I'm right there with you. I turned 66 last Saturday, and uh, I know yeah, I'm a spring chicken to some of you, and uh, we're not going to be, how much longer are we going to be here? Not much longer. So look, gear up and make a spiritual thrust to the end. It may be sooner than you think. So, we have become fearful of losing our own little world. Are we afraid to stand up and speak up for Christ? I mean, do you give the gospel to anybody in, during your daily life? People at work? We go to Moody in the mornings with Willie and we walk around the track. You know, we invite people to church, give them the gospel. You know, we're open for business, folks. This is why we're here. This is what will turn things around. People getting saved. People growing in grace. People asking the Lord. Lord, open the doors for us. Make things, uh, protect us. Protect us from these evil ones. Or use these evil ones for our growth. God appears about to let us lose our human freedoms so that we can realize that our spiritual freedoms are what, re what is really important. And that adversity is a better teacher than prosperity. So, you know, it's become clear that Christians and conservative type people, they don't have the same voice as others. Even, even with the, the justice system, it doesn't appear there. So there seems to be a difference. And so we're, we're, on, the, we're on, the, on the bad side of that deal. So just prepare yourself. So, in Romans chapter 1, if you'll turn to Romans chapter 1 with me, I want to do a little reading with you, and probably be the end of it. Romans 1, 16 through 32, Paul explains how God has used the natural order of creation as a revelation, an apocalypto to uncover and reveal something hidden. That's what apocalypto means. And he has, he has used creation as a revelation of his invisible essence for all people, all through history. When his divine, when his divine revelation of imputed righteousness in the gospel <clears throat> is accepted by faith, the believer is blessed by the power of God unto salvation and given eternal life. But, listen, when you get to verse 18 here, 16 and 17, there's the best news you ever heard. You know, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first, then the Greek. And in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God has been revealed. Wow. Imputed righteousness from believing the gospel. But when you get to verse 18, all the way through 32, what you're going to see is those who rejected that revelation. So first, let me read, let me read this for you, okay? 
Start at verse 16. Romans 1, 16. He says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Amen. For, it is it, for in it, gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith at salvation to faith in the Christian life. And it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. In other words, once you're saved, the way you live is by faith in, in, the, in more and more and more of the Word of God. So, he says, here's the righteousness of God has been revealed in the gospel. Then in verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them in their conscience. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, the creation, so that so that all men are without excuse. For even though they knew God, in other words, they had this revelation, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him as God, but they became futile in their speculations. That's the mateotes. They became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. That's evil in their heart. Professing to be wise, they became fools. See, here's your first rejection. And then there's going to be rejection, revelation, rejection. Then there's going to be an exchange. It's five things in this passage. So he goes, and they exchange. See, there's the exchange, verse 23. The glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. You know, when I read that, I wondered, why were they so enamored with birds and reptiles? I don't know. Therefore, verse 24, God gave them over. Really, really bad words. God gave them over to the lust in their hearts, to, to impurity, that their, their bodies might be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God. See, there's another exchange. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. So again, for this reason, God gave them over to degrading, awful passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. So see, we've gone from one level of depravity and exchanging God. Now we're exchanging the truth about God for a lie, the lie that anything goes. And so the women gave up the natural sexual use, and in the same way the men abandoned the natural uh, sexual function of women and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men committing indecent acts, receiving in their own person the due penalty of their error. I wonder what that is, huh? The due penalty. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, rejecting, 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 God gave them over, they reject God, and He rejects them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. And here's where it really gets bad. Being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, they are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful inventors of evil. I mean, they get creative about evil. Disobedient to parents without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. That's, that's where you're down. That's where we are. And although they knew the ordinance of God, 
that those who practice such things are worthy of death. Do they know it? Has it been taught in America? Has this had these concepts? Is it, are these things clearly delineated in the United States that these things are wrong and evil? Well, apparently no longer because everything's flipped, but it says they know. Although they know the ordinance of God that those who practice all of these things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. So, this, this is degeneracy. This is where America is, and uh, if, if I get a chance to come back again, I'll, I'll dig into that. Let me give you finally, at the bottom of your page, you're going to see five things in here as an outline. You're going to see the revelation of God's existence and His righteousness through the gospel. You're going to see the rejection of this revelation and causing them to op be open the mataeotes, the opening to evil. You're going to see the revelation of truth and the revelation of God exchanged for empty logic, foolish lies, and idolatry. You're going to see they are released. God gave them up to pursue their ever-increasing degeneration into sin and evil. And finally, you're going to see the results of all this is their degenerate beliefs were manifested by a degenerate culture. So, Father, is that us? I mean, hopefully it's not us in this church. Are, are, do we, are we part of the answer? Are we part of the solution? I have to believe that. I have to believe that all these years of learning and growing and laying aside old man hindrances and old man uh, anger and bitterness and hurt and pain and freeing the soul to love and give and be generous, somehow that's got to be part of the answer. And so... I ask you to use me and my heart, my soul, my knowledge, my gift, my generosity, my giving to be part of the solution for all of this. And, and more than anything, I pray that you lead people to the Lord and allow this church to teach them and disciple them and grow them up in Christ so that we might have a brand new start for my children and grandchildren should the Lord tarry. But Father, if we're right at the end, then I echo John's words, come Lord Jesus, come. And it's in his name we pray, amen.